G'day mate, Luke Ford here, and so I'm awake, thought I might as well do a little streaming, and let's see, uh, Christopher Cantwell is in the news again, he went on JF Greppi last night, and uh, Ralph Retort, and he's at war with Joaquim Hawk and the Heel Turn YouTube channel, so uh, maybe we'll be able to get Christopher Cantwell on the show later today. So meanwhile, let's go back to our readings from yesterday. So we're talking about Romans instituting a census in 6 AD after the banishment of Archelaus when Jesus was about 12 years old. We're reading from a Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance by the Jewish scholar Haya Maccabee, and he definitely has a point of view in the Jewish Christian polemics, he's on the Jewish side. And here we go. The Gospel of Luke gets this wrong, antedating the census of and census of Cyrenius by twelve years to the time of Herod. No Roman census ever took place in a client kingdom, and in any case, the census did not include Galilee, which remained a client princedom. The Jews understood well enough that the census was the preliminary to taxation. It was the resistance to this census that led to the fun founding of the Zealot Party by Judas of Galilee, a Pharisee rabbi. Now, it sounds a lot like the founding of the United States of America, right? No taxation without representation, except the uh, United States of America was a successful enterprise and the Jewish wars with Rome led to the end of an independent Jewish state for almost 2,000 years. Of the zealots, Josephus says, these men agree in all other things, the Pharisaic notions, but they have an inviolable attachment to liberty, and they say that God is to be their only ruler and Lord. Again, doesn't this sound like the American revolutionaries? The Romans crushed this rebellion, and Judas of Galilee was killed, but his movement, the zealots, lived on, and they were eventually the chief architects of the Jewish War of 66, of the common era against Rome, the first major Jewish war against Rome. The census of Cyrenius was a very thorough one, consisting of evaluation of all property and incomes, as well as a listing of the inhabitants. Taxes levied were a land tax, an income tax, and a poll tax, a water tax, a city tax, taxes on meat and salt, a road tax, a house tax, boundary taxes, a market tax, as well as various burdensome customs duties and bridge tolls. The Jews also paid a voluntary tax for the upkeep of the temple. The Romans generously agreed not to confiscate this tax for their own use. After the Jewish war, this concession was rescinded the Romans collected the temple tax for themselves, making it compulsory. There's no pretense that the taxes collected by the Romans were to be used for the benefit of Palestine. Certain sums were indeed earmarked for public works, but the bulk of the money and goods collected were sent to Rome and paid into Augustus's personal account. The Romans at this time regarded their empire as a vehicle for exploitation. The furthest they went in the direction of trusteeship was to have a concern not to overtax to the point of destitution. That's when Tiberius reproved a zealous governor of Egypt for sending to Rome an extravagantly large sum in taxes, saying that it was a governor's job to fleece the sheep, not to flay them. The Roman thinker Cicero gives two explanations of the Roman right to exact tribute from conquered regions. One is that the tribute is a fine or indemnity for having had the temerity to resist Roman power, the other is that the Romans own the conquered territory by right of conquest and are therefore entitled to demand rent from the inhabitants. It's not until about 80 of the common era that some bright Roman apologist thought of an explanation more in line with the edifying self-justification of modern empires that the Romans were entitled to payment for the boon of the Pax Romana. So we see once again that the strong take what they want and the weak endure what they must. Okay, what is uh, President Trump saying this morning? Uh, 
Uh, he's complaining about the mes- news media <laughs> and uh, Democratic Senator Dick Blumenthal complaining. Ah, he's complimenting that Chrysler is adding 6,500 jobs in Michigan. And uh, he's talking about his, his talks with the leader of North Korea. Okay. In addition to the depredations of the publicans, those are the tax collectors, the Jews had to endure the exactions of the governors or procurators themselves. In the larger provinces, Augustus's program of reform was beginning to have some effect, but in the minor subject areas like Judea, it was as yet a little curb on the rapacity of the Roman officials. By the time a Roman in public life had succeeded in obtaining a provincial governorship, he was usually heavily in debt because of the huge bribes both to individuals and to the public in the way of entertainment that it was necessary to pay for public advancement. The governorship was the reward for these expenditures. Here was the point of the exercise, the opportunity to repay one's debts and build up a f- personal fortune as well. Not only the governor, but the subordinate members of his staff were out to exploit the opportunities for enrichment. Their ingenuity in extracting money from their unfortunate subjects was notorious. For every service, bakshish, a bribe, was required. Before a man could see the governor on a matter of elementary justice, he had to pay a host of officials ending with the governor himself. Suitable sums of money, one could buy protection from orders to billet troops or to supply free grain and means of transport for the army. The governors were not even above setting up funds for voluntary donations to the governor in gratitude for his services. So we're lucky that uh, those of us in America and England and Australia, we live under Anglo-Saxon norms by and large, where we don't have to bribe the government to get what we want. But that's still pretty much the way of the world. Okay, Babs wants uh, more, more energy. It's 11 in Vienna, a sunny day. It's the best time to listen to Luke. <laughs> Rukashem. Okay, uh, the, uh, the nose strip is to open up my nasal passages so it reduces my sleep apnea and also the nasal dilator. Yeah, those nose strips really work. They open up the nasal passages. You breathe better at night and consequently you sleep better. Believe me. At the same time, the setting up of Roman rule in a new area was the signal for the entry of various sinister characters from Rome whose business was to profit from the distress of the natives. They advanced loans to those who were hard-pressed to pay the new taxes at up to 50% interest, and they sold their debtors into slavery when they had squeezed out the last possible penny. They used their ample funds to corner the wheat harvest and then sold the wheat in areas of shortage at hugely inflated prices. To be taken over by Rome at this time was like being taken over by a swarm of locusts. Judea was not the only sufferer, even the worst, the peasants of Egypt, for example, where the pickings were richer, suffered even more. In the Gospels, criticism of Roman rule is carefully avoided. However, some faint echoes of the conditions described above do occasionally creep in. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 12, John the Baptist is represented as advising the tax gatherers, exact no more than the assessment. And follows soldiers on service also asked him and what of us to them he said no bullying no blackmail make do with your pay to enforce their rule the romans had troops stationed in judea the quarters of these troops were at caesarea a coastal town which had been built by herod in the greco roman style there was a permanent body of three thousand soldiers at caesarea and smaller garrisons in the other main towns In Jerusalem, the Roman garrison consisted of 500 soldiers. So it's like the life of Brian. 
It is probable that a large proportion of these soldiers consisted of Samaritans, men from the Palestinian district of Samaria, where a variant of Judaism was practiced with a dissident temple on Mount Gerizim. The occupying forces were thus not large, but they could be quickly reinforced in time of trouble from the large Roman force in Syria. 15,000 Roman heavily armed troops, together with about the same number of lightly armed auxiliaries. The Samaritans were much disliked by the Jews, not only because they belonged to a heretical sect, but also because they habitually robbed and killed Jews who entered their territory. So you hear about the Good Samaritan in the Gospels? Well, apparently there weren't that many Good Samaritans from a Jewish perspective. Must have been very galling to the Jews to be under the authority of a Roman occupying force, which the traditionally hostile Samaritans were given a prominent place. That the usual headquarters of the procurator were in Caesarea, about 60 miles from Jerusalem, he came up to Jerusalem with a large armed escort at festival times, meaning Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot. Three times every year, when the large crowds of pilgrims needed to be policed, this accounts for the presence of Pilate in Jerusalem at the time of the arrest of Jesus. I don't know why I'm awake. I, got, I guess uh, God wants me to be awake now. So here we go. Even more important to the Jews than loss of liberty and physical and economic oppression was the humiliation they now suffered in connection with their religion. Officially, the Romans continued the policy of Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar of respect towards the Jewish religion. But the period with which they, we are concerned, the life of Jesus, was one in which this official policy was very inadequately realized in practice. The Romans were aware that nothing goaded the Jews to fury so much as an insult to their religious practices or beliefs. So the instructions of the emperors Augustus and Tiberius, who succeeded Augustus in year 14, were to avoid any such provocation. In particular, it was agreed that no idolatrous images, including the military standards of the Roman troops, were to be displayed in the holy city of Jerusalem. However, the procurators were brutal, narrow-minded men who had no appreciation of Jewish monotheism and saw it merely as an affront to their pride as Romans. The Jews were in continual anxiety that the temple should be polluted by some deliberate act of idolatry. They had not forgotten the desecrations perpetrated by the Syrian Greek tyrant Antiochus Epiphanes, or as we say in English, Antiochus Epiphanes. I heard that name a ton when I was growing up because it was an area of special research by my father. He turned the Jewish temple into a shrine of Zeus and offered a swine's flesh there in his honor. The continuance of the worship of the one God in the holy city now depended on the whim of the Roman emperor. He might change his mind at any moment and decide to install the statue of a pagan God or even a statue of his own divine self in the Holy of Holies. That this anxiety was not groundless was shown not many years later, in year 39, when the Emperor Caligula did indeed issue an order that a statue of himself should be set up in the temple and worshipped as a god. The general rising of the Jews at this time was only prevented by Caligula's opportune death. Okay, so I was having an interesting conversation with a non-Jewish friend, which is apropos... So, let's find that. Okay, and uh, so my non-Jewish friend says, this is what you want. He sends me a link. The Decian persecution resulted from an edict issued in year 250 of the Common Era by the Emperor Decius, ordering everyone in the Roman Empire except for Jews who were exempted to perform a sacrifice to the Roman gods and the well-being of the emperor. The edict ordered that the sacrifices be performed in the presence of a Roman magistrate and a signed and witnessed certificate be issued to that effect. Do 
was the first time that Christians had faced legislation forcing them to choose between their religious beliefs and death. Although there is no evidence that Decius's edict was specifically intended to target Christians. The edict appears to have been designed more as an empire-wide loyalty oath. Nevertheless, a number of Christians were put to death for refusing to perform the sacrifices. Many others apostatized and performed the ceremonies, and others went into hiding. The effects were long-lasting, caused tension between Christians who had performed the sacrifices or fled and those who had not, and left bitter memories of persecution. So about 70 years later, the Roman Emperor, Roman Empire turned Christian. And uh, my non-Jewish friend says, this is what you want today. You want Jews to be exempted from empire. And he says, you think there might be a legal loophole for blue-eyed people to start credit unions and scholarships and so on? Then he says uh, he had a dinner conversation with his uh, young son who knows all about Martin Luther King, Harriet Tubman, abolitionism, emancipation, big words, Jim Crow, the KKK, Rosa Parks. It's all awesome. Of course, he knows 11 times as much about white history because every other month is white history month. And uh, my friend says, I'm watching your vid from yesterday at this time. I'll, I'll see if I can find that Higher Maccabee book. I've been thinking a lot about Antiochus Epiphanes in relation to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, and the law of Moses in general. Nobody wants to be forced to make sacrifices to a God they don't believe in, so I get the Maccabees wanting to rebel. But uh, isn't Jewish law full of rules about how the Gentiles will have to live in the Jewish kingdom and eating kosher, being circumcised, etc.? Nehemiah is all about expelling what is foreign and building a wall. When Hadrian or Antiochus tried that, oh, we can't have that. So I'm kind of partial to these emperors lately. I mean, they wanted to create a strong national sense of Hellenic identity, just like Solomon wanted Jews to have a strong sense of Jewish identity. It's a perfect parallel. It strikes me that among the Orthodox Jews, when you ask a question like, in principle, should a nation be allowed to expel outsiders? They cannot answer according to philosophical principle. They would have to stop you and ask, well, talking about the Jewish nation or about another nation. Still, can't really decide if that's bad of them or not. I know they would say it was bad if I acted like that, or he's considering not the principle, but my identity and my tribal interests first. But is it bad if they do that? It seems like it must be unless God chose them to serve that special purpose. And I responded, Orthodox Jews do not care what non-Jews eat and do far higher percentage of Orthodox Jews would say yes than whites to the question, in principle, should a nation be allowed to expel outsiders? Probably 25% of Orthodox Jews would say yes, and about 5% of whites. I see myself as 100% consistent. There is nothing that I want for my group, be it whites or Jews, that I would not equally want for every other group. But my primary agenda is understanding how the world works. That's more important to me than activism. Okay, so my friend sends a link to an article on myjewishlearning.com by Ari Alexander, Israel and Anti-Gentile Traditions. Israel Shahak's theory that anti-Gentile traditions have influenced Israeli policy is well known in both Arab and anti-Semitic circles, but Jews have yet to properly confront it. Okay. So that's interesting. I have read Israel Shahak, and he is a fierce critic of Judaism. And uh, he was someone who lived in Israel for decades. Despite his title, Israel Shahak's book, Jewish History, Jewish Religion, 1994, it's not your average intro to Judaism book. It is more likely to be found in a Muslim day school in Damascus than a Jewish day school in New York more likely to be cited on a neo-Nazi website than your local synagogues. Shahak's book is an overview of Judaism and Zionism, which focuses on Jewish anti-Gentile traditions. Though he recognizes that many of these teachings are no longer authoritative, 
Shahak believes that they have nonetheless had a profound influence on the development of Jewish identity over the centuries. Most importantly, he believes that they have seeped into Zionist ideology and have affected the way Israel interacts with its non-Jewish citizens and neighbors. Hey, Ben Noak, thank you so much for the super chats. Yeah, I'm feeling fine. I'm just not sleeping, so I might as well uh, might as well start streaming, right? Is Luke doing okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just uh, I'm just awake. So if I'm awake, why not be streaming, bro? Oh, I guess July is White History Month. Uh, Luke's behavior has been different lately. It must be those reishi mushrooms. Yeah, I'm doing great. Is there some Jewish holiday that explains this change in behavior or broadcasting patterns? No. India and Pakistan are shooting down each other's fighter jets. Do I know the jets involved? Nope. Not sleeping is a symptom. Stream is life. To stream is to live, bro. Well, the important thing is that I slept pretty well between uh, about 9 p.m. and 1 a.m. So I've had some good sleep. Now I'm going to stream until I get sleepy again. Then I'll go back to bed and I'll get some more sleep. And I'll wake up tomorrow refreshed. I think I biked about eight miles last night after my stream. So let's keep rocking and rolling. Israel Shahak, a Holocaust survivor and died in 2001, was for many years a professor of chemistry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He also led the Israeli Civil Rights League from the mid-1970s until 1990. In Israel, he was a controversial figure, but he was revered by the international left as a tireless advocate for human rights. A Jewish lives worth more. In Jewish history, Jewish religion, Shahak brings numerous texts and legal rulings to demonstrate Jewish antipathy to non-Jews. He mentions a passage from the Talmud that says that Jesus will be punished in hell by being immersed in boiling excrement. He relates that Jewish tradition teaches pious Jews to burn copies of the New Testament and curse the mothers of the dead when passing non-Jewish cemeteries. Shahak highlights the famous passage from Leviticus commanding Jews to love thy neighbors thyself and mentions that, according to rabbinic interpretation, thy neighbor was only to Jews. Now, I read this book in 2001 and blogged about it and uh, got a lot of outraged reactions from Jews saying, how could you say anything about this book is just some vile piece of anti-Jewish self-hatred. Shahak further suggests that the Jewish tradition values Jewish life more than Gentile life, which you'd expect, right? He cites Maimonides' assertion that whereas one who murders a Jew is subject to the death penalty, one who murders a non-Jew is not. That's from the Mishneh Torah, Laws of Murder 2.11. According to another leading commentator, indirectly causing the death of a non-Jew is no sin at all. Israel Shahak reiterates the well-known Jewish teaching that the duty to save a life supersede, supersedes all other obligations, and notes that the rabbis interpreted this to apply to Jews only. According to the Talmud, Gentiles are neither to be lifted out of a well nor hauled down into it. Maimonides writes, As for Gentiles with whom we are not at war, the death must not be caused, but it is forbidden to save them if they are at the point of death. If, for example, one of them is seen falling into the sea, should not be rescued, for it is written, Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy fellow, but a Gentile is not thy fellow. Maimonides is the focus of much of Shahak's analysis. Shahak believes that the 12th century philosopher and Talmudist was a Gentile hater and racist. He quotes Maimonides' statement that the Turks and blacks nature is like the nature of mute animals, and according to my opinion, they are not on the level of human beings. Israel Shahak recognizes that many of these traditions are not followed in practice, but he believes that, in general, they have been covered up instead of confronted. In support of this claim, he refers to another violent passage from Maimonides that is not translated in the bilingual edition 
of the guide published in Jerusalem in 1962. He sees this as a deliberate deception on the part of the editors to soften a classical Jewish militancy. His own English translation of the passage, which discussed the command to kill Jewish infidels, reads, It is a duty to exterminate them with one's hands, such one's own hands, such as Jesus of Nazareth and his pupils, Sadak and Betos, the founders of the Sadducees and their pupils, may the name of the wicked rot. According to Israel Shahak, Jewish traditions of contempt infiltrated Zionism and have affected Israeli policy toward, towards its Arab citizens and the Palestinians. He cites three main areas where he believes this has occurred, residency rights, employment rights, and equality before the law. As an example, he mentions that 92% of Israel's land is legally restricted to Jews, while in other countries it would be labeled anti-Semitic if a policy excluded Jews from living on or owning land the Israeli context Jews tolerate it. He adds that based on the distinction in classical Judaism between reverence for Jewish cemeteries and not for non-Jewish ones, the state of Israel has destroyed hundreds of Muslim cemeteries, including one to build the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv. Perhaps most disturbingly, Israel Shahak cites a booklet published by the Central Regional Command of the Israeli Army, which states that it is permissible and even encouraged to kill civilians encountered in war. In war, when our forces storm the enemy, they are allowed and even enjoined by the halakha, that's Jewish law, to kill even good civilians, that is, civilians who are ostensibly good. In a footnote, Shahak mentions that this booklet was withdrawn from circulation on the command of the chief of staff, but he nonetheless believes that even the brief appearance of such a text can only be explained by an accurate assessment of the inequality in Jewish tradition between the lives of Jews and non-Jews. Jews have ignored Shahak's work, but others haven't. That's true. Uh, Jews get very annoyed with me if I ever talk about this book. Whatever your opinion of Shahak and his arguments, Jewish history, Jewish religion should be taken seriously for a number of reasons. So I'm right. We all know I'm not an authority on Judaism, so I, I don't know if he is uh, mistranslating these texts or wrenching them out of context or, or what. For one, the text that Shahak cites are real. That's my understanding. Though Shahak's sporadic use of footnotes makes it difficult to check all of them. Often, the interpretation of these texts is debatable and their prominence in Judaism negligible, but nonetheless, they are part of Jewish tradition and therefore cannot be ignored. Indeed, they are not ignored. Shahak's work is very popular in both Arab and Muslim circles. Radio Islam contains the full text of Shahak's work, as well as groups that are often openly anti-Semitic, David Duke and Bradley Smith include Shahak's book on their websites. Others use Shahak's work in their presentation of Judaism. That fact alone should make it relevant to contemporary Jews. Shahak was an ardent secularist and anti-Zionist, but he wrote his book as a challenge to Jews to engage the chauvinist, dehumanizing elements of Jewish tradition to help create a self-critical and sensitive modern Judaism. It's true that he combed the rabbinic tradition in search of hateful passages, often though by no means always misinterpreting them and taking them out of context, but this may be beside the point. Jewish texts exist that can be and are understood to be vehemently xenophobic. These texts must be openly and honestly grappled with, explained, and if necessary, repudiated. Okay, what's going on in the chat? It's all Reishi energy, baby. You pedaled for eight miles, yet you biked nowhere. That's true. I'm talking about my stationary bike while I was watching True Detective. If uh, Ford's audience got me the new stabilized GoPro, I would stream from my bicycle daily, my commutes and stuff. Okay, let's keep rocking and rolling here. We're going to go back to revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish resistance. The Roman procurators, observing that the Jews were a people of unusually strong religious feeling, attempted 
to use this feeling to their own advantage by exercising control over the Jewish religious establishment. Right, this is very common. When you're an empire, you may try to cut deal with the, the elites that you are subjugating. It is natural that the Romans should think that the temple was the center of Jewish worship and that the chief official of the temple, the high priest, was the chief object of veneration and religious loyalty. In this, the Romans were mistaken. Under the influence of the Pharisees, the temple, despite its imposing rites, had ceased to be of primary spiritual importance to the Jews, and the priesthood had long ago lost their spiritual and moral authority to the Pharisee lay leaders, or hakamim centered in that extraordinary institution, the synagogue. Nevertheless, the Roman measures to take over control of the temple were deeply resented. For example, the vestments of the high priest, which were used in the New Year and Day of Atonement ceremonies, were taken in charge by the Roman procurator with the implied threat that in case of insubordination, they would not be made available for the atoning ceremonies. No doubt the Romans exaggerated the importance of these vestments in the Jewish mind, they thought that the Jews regarded the garments as having a kind of magical power, like the veil of the goddess Tanit in the Carthagin Carthaginian religion, the loss of which led to the disintegration of military morale. This was not the case, yet the Jews were indeed irritated and resentful to think that these much-loved vestments were in Gentile hands. More important was the fact that the Romans now actually appointed and dismissed high priests at will. Valerius Gratus, the procurator immediately before Pontius Pilate, deposed and appointed four high priests. His last appointment was Caiaphas, the high priest who was concerned in the arrest of Jesus. Again, the Romans did not achieve what they had expected by these tactics. The result was not a deeper submission to Roman rule, but an increased contempt for the occupant of the high priesthood. So when Rome wanted to make sure that one particular high priest at this time uh, Never in the Kohen Gadol, that's what we'd call them in Hebrew. They, they uh, uh, cut his ears <laughs> because the, the Kohen Gadol, the, the high priest, he can't have physical deformities. So if they just butcher someone's ears, then that person can never serve as the high priest. It's like if you want to stop someone from YouTube streaming, that's what you do. How's the new season? It's a uh, true detective. It's uh, it's pretty good. I loved the first season. The second season sucked. And Bab says the Pharisees made Judaism a weak cuck religion. We were idiots to seize these aesthetic victories to Rome in favor of becoming surviving but lifeless husks in a diasporic state of cultural permadeath. The ceremonial rites which the high priest officiated were not invalidated by the fact that he was personally contemptible as a creature of the Romans. But there was no question of such a high priest having any teaching authority in matters of morals or religion. It had been a long time in any case since the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, had held such authority. Herod the Greet, Great had used the high priest as lackeys before his time. The Hasmonean policy of combining the high priesthood with the royal throne had destroyed the religious authority of the high priest in the eyes of the Pharisees and the masses who followed their teaching. Nevertheless, the high priesthood itself was still an institution of historic importance, and the cynical way in which the Romans manipulated it and reduced it to a mockery was much resented. It was bad enough that Herod the Great had manipulated the high priesthood. Herod, though an unpopular king of foreign extraction, was at least a Jew, and in his reign the Jews could entertain the illusion that they were a free people. But that the high priest was appointed to office by an idolater of a foreign nation was a mark of the slavery into which the Jewish people had now sunk. In 
Year 26, the fifth procurator, Pontius Pilate, began his term of office. As we have seen, the Gospels portray him as a well-meaning, humane man. From other sources, however, it appears he was the worst procurator so far. Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish philosopher, quotes his judgment of Pilate. He was cruel by nature and hard-hearted and entirely lacking in remorse. Philo also gives the following account of Pilate's rule in Judea. Bribes, vainglorious and insolent conduct, robbery, oppression, humiliations, men often sent to death untried, and incessant and unmitigated cruelty. Josephus portrays Pilate as deliberately seeking to outrage the religious feelings of the Jews. He took the unprecedented step of marching his army of occupation from its usual quarters in Caesarea to the holy city of Jerusalem in order, says Josephus, to abolish the Jewish laws. The standards of the Roman troops contained images of Tiberius Caesar pictured as a god. To the Jews, the presence of these idolatrous images in Jerusalem was an affront to the one true God. Previous procurators had all understood that the Jews were prepared to suffer mass slaughter rather than allow this blasphemy, and whenever they brought troops into Jerusalem, therefore, they would leave the offending standards behind. Why then did Pilate depart so conspicuously from the policy of his predecessors and deliberately carry out this act of provocation? It has been suggested that he was given secret orders by his patron Sejanus, powerful minister of Tiberius. It is thought that Pilate received his appointment in Judea through the influence of Sejanus, a bitter anti-Semite who had helped to foment anti-Jewish pogroms in Alexandria. In any event, Pilate's move failed. He had hoped once the standards were established in Jerusalem, the Jews would accept the fait accompli. Evidently, his orders were not to push the matter to the point where the Jews would break out into rebellion. When he found that the solidarity of the Jews was complete, he withdrew the offending standards. Sejanus wished to humiliate the Jews, but not if it would cause embarrassment with his master, Tiberius. Though Pilate failed in this affair, his general conduct of the Roman administration was brutal and corrupt. It was during the period of this man's rule that Jesus' public career took place. It was a time when distress, despair, apocalyptic yearnings, and helpless resentment of the Roman tyranny were at their height. It was a time when no Jew could avoid sharing the deep unhappiness caused by the Roman presence, and the Jewish people, and especially the poorest among them, were being driven to despair by exorbitant taxes when the Jews were compelled to compare the reality of the constant humiliation, their soaring aspirations as a people. Yet the Gospels portray Jesus as an unpolitical figure to whom the independence of his people from the yoke of idolatrous, cruel, and exploiting invaders was a matter of no importance. Chapter 4, Romans and Jews How did the Jews appear to the Romans, and how did the Romans appear to the Jews? It is important to investigate these questions to understand the phenomenon of the Jewish resistance. Remember the title of his book, his book by Chaim Maccabee, which came out in 1974, is Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. What happened to my nose? I'm just trying to make it look more Jewish. Yeah, it's all part of the conversion process. Yeah, I've got my, that's, that's my Essentia. Essentia stack in the background there. Wow, you liked season two, A True Detective? You're the first person I met who liked it. All right, back to the book. From the standpoint of Greco-Roman society, the Jews were barbarians. That is to say, the Jews of Palestine did not form part of the general culture nowadays called Hellenistic, which dates from the conquests of Alexander the Great and derives ultimately from the great cultural advances of Athens. Hellenistic culture had the same self-confidence and belief in its civilizing mission as could be found until very recently in the Western industrial civilization of modern times.
even in centers of ancient civilization such as Egypt, the Hellenistic culture established itself and proved irresistible. Alexandria in Egypt was a great Hellenistic city, so was Antioch in Syria. The fascination of Hellenistic culture came from a compound of many things. The new military science, which was copied by all the militaristic powers, including the Carthaginians and the Romans. The brilliant life of the Hellenistic city with its citizen assemblies, its theater, with its repertory of tragedy and comedy, its amphitheater or stadium for athletic performances and contests, its libraries and universities, its literature, with its tremendous range, poetry in various meters and styles, drama, philosophy, history, and its wonderful discoveries in science and mathematics, an ever-growing fountain of achievement. Even barbarian kings whose lands lay outside the Hellenistic zone were overawed by the Hellenistic culture and were proud to call themselves on inscriptions and medals, Phil Hellene. So this is kind of like America today. So Hellenistic culture, the Roman Empire at this point are about to enter a fairly dramatic decline because they've been undergoing dysgenic trends for a couple of centuries. So too in the West, we've been undergoing a dysgenic trend since 1850. I mean, we've been getting steadily stupider over the past 270 years. So we are now in the winter of our civilization. The center cannot hold. The Romans were originally a barbarian nature nation, but they adopted the Hellenistic, Hellenistic means from Greece, Hellenistic culture, and eventually by their conquest became the dominant power in the whole Hellenistic region. So it was, it was the thrusting Romans who adopted the, the wise culture of the Greeks. This region was not identical with that comprised by the conquest of Alexander the Great, which had extended as far as India and some Jews went with him to India. Areas in the west of Europe and Africa were added by the Romans. Areas in the east were lost to the Parthians and other non-Hellenic peoples before the Romans became dominant. So Rome reaches its zenith basically by about uh, year 70 of the Common Era. That's when the Roman Empire reached its height, so about 40 years after the death of Jesus. The Romans became wholehearted Hellenists. They abandoned their own crude culture and remodeled their literature on the Greek pattern. So it's a little bit like the relationship of thrusting America to the wise Greeks of England. They even altered their legends to give themselves a Hellenic background. They gave currency to a legacy that they were descended from Aeneas, one of the Trojan heroes celebrated by Homer. Yet it is true to say that all this Hellenism did not go very deep. Underneath the Hellenistic veneer, even despite the brilliant Hellenistic literature which they produced, the Romans were still Romans, a nation with war and violence in its soul. Behind the graceful legend of Aeneas, son of the goddess of love, lay another legend, that of Romulus and Remus, the twin sons of the god of war, suckled by a she-wolf. In this legend, the city of Rome was founded in blood. Romulus quarreled with Remus and murdered him as they worked on the foundations, a Cain and Abel story in which Cain is the hero. And the good omen which Romulus saw while working on the foundations was a flight of 12 vultures, showing that Rome would be a warlike and powerful nation, since the vulture is fond of prey and slaughter. In Rome, Cicero might make speeches in the accents of Demosthenes, or Virgil sing in golden hexameters of the civilizing mission of Rome. But in Judea, the meaning of Rome was the vulture and the wolf. The institutions of crucifixion, of the gladiatorial combat, and the wild beast show were the distinctly Roman contributions to Hellenistic civilizations. Yet, as the representatives of Hellenism, the Romans felt themselves entitled to feel superior to the Jews, a barbarian nation who had actually refused to conform to the Hellenistic mold. So this is a little bit like the relationship of Israel today to Western civilization. Oh, we got glib medley here. The first Jewish theater critic has been forgotten, but they have unearthed Theater Thursday tablets. It 
Season two of Private True Detective is worth a second look. Really, there are positive reviews by Pleasure Man and Jay Dyer. Huh. I, I couldn't stand it from episode one, but I did watch it all the way through. Not that the Jews were untouched by Hellenism, but they had the audacity to approach it in a critical spirit, to assess it in the light of their own cultural tradition, to approve part of it and to reject part of it. This is just like Israel today in the West. In Alexandria, the Jews who comprised a large proportion of the population became very Hellenized. They spoke Greek and adopted Greek names. They studied and even wrote Greek literature. So I'm going to send a Hangouts link to see if anyone wants to uh, come in. Yeah, Babs, come on in, talk about Henry V production, if you like. So we're lining up uh, Christopher Cantwell to uh, come on the show. And I'm just going to send out an invite now to see if anyone wants to come to this hangout. I'm discussing a book by Hayam Maccabee, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. This book was published in 1974. Hey, Babs, if you want to come on in, I sent you an invite. In Alexandria, the Jews who comprised a large proportion of the population became very Hellenized. They spoke Greek and adopted Greek names. They studied and even wrote Greek literature. But their main, Philo, for example, he didn't even uh, know Hebrew. He was that Hellenized. But their main intellectual effort was to incorporate the Hellenic insights into their own Judaic tradition. Philo, the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher, whose life overlapped that of Jesus, created a synthesis of Judaism and Hellenism which later became a model to the Christian church in its struggle to create a theology. In Palestine itself, Hellenism was actively rejected because of Hellenistic rulers. About 200 years before the birth of Jesus, made strenuous efforts to eradicate Judaism and introduce Hellenism by force. And even here, Hellenism was allowed some value. The rabbi studied Greek science and mathematics and admired the beauty of the Greek language. A rabbinical interpretation of the verse in Genesis, God shall give beauty to Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, while well, this refers to the Greek translation of the Bible. But the Jews had no reason to succumb wholly to Hellenism, as the Romans and other nations tried to do, because the Greek Jews had an intellectual and cultural tradition, beside which that of Hellenism seemed brilliantly parvenu. The Hebrew Bible is not a book but a whole literature comprising history, myth, lyric poetry, and impassioned ideology. Though Hebrew literature lacks the range of artistry to be found in Greek literature, it contains qualities that Greek literature cannot parallel. A majesty and universality, a seriousness of purpose, and a sense of social justice. Other ancient cultures, the Egyptian, for example, resisted Hellenism, but none resisted it so successfully. The Jewish culture was not a fossil, it was still very much alive. As for the Romans, they were newcomers, even in the field of Hellenism. The literary works which have raised the name of Rome above that of mere conquerors were, in the time of Jesus, achievements of the very recent past. Virgil had died in year 19 before the Common Era. I am reading the book, 1974 book, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. The average Roman, even of the ruling patrician class, would know very little about them. While among the Jews, the Bible was the subject of elementary education, even among artisans and agricultural laborers. 
Thus, the situation of the Roman occupation of Palestine was rather like that in China in the 19th century. At the period of the infiltration of the Western powers who regarded themselves as representatives of the world's most advanced civilization, while the Chinese regarded them as uncouth Johnny-come-latelys. It was not only the Jews who despised the cultural pretensions of the Romans, the Greeks too regarded their Roman masters as uncouth, and unlike the Jews, the Greeks accepted their military defeat as final. It was the Greeks who, unprompted, were the first to offer divine worship to the Roman emperor and the goddess Roma. The attitude of the Greeks to the Romans was sycophantic to their face and sneering behind their backs. A symbolic incident was the visit of Nero to Greece about 30 years after the death of Jesus. Nero, the Roman emperor, fancied himself as a musician, singer, and poet. He entered for the various artistic competitions in Greece, taking the matter with the utmost seriousness and waiting nervously for the judge's verdict. In every competition, he was unanimously adjudged the winner and acclaimed as a genius, while at the same time the Greeks were laughing among themselves at the amateurishness of his performances. This incident symbolized the relationship between Greece and Rome, the pathetic yearning of the Romans to share in Hellenistic culture and the complete submission of the Greeks to Roman military power, combined with a tongue-in-cheek sense of superiority. The Jews never adopted this attitude to Rome because they never wholly submitted. Greek culture, despite its magnificence, did not contain the stuff of martyrdom or the will to fight to the end for freedom, though the creed of Stoicism did have its individual heroic martyrs. This is perhaps the reason why the Greeks of the Roman Empire so hated the Jews, Historical origin of anti-Semitism is among the very Greeks who resented the fact that Jews had never lost their innermost freedom to Rome. In Alexandria, where Greek hatred of the Jews was most bitter, the Greeks continually denounced the Jews to Rome as disloyal and were particularly resentful because the Jews had been granted the privilege of not having to give divine worship to the Roman emperor. Yeah, the Rome is with a globalist elite. The Jews respected Hellenism, though they had strong reservations about it. They had no respect for Rome, which they regarded as a purely militaristic power. They identified Rome with Esau, Esau, the warlike brother of Jacob. Perhaps the most distinctive thing about the Jewish cultural tradition, a characteristic which made it unique in the ancient world, was that it contained no glorification of war. The Romans, like the Nazis, really thought that war was the nurse of all the virtues. The Jews fought bravely on many occasions for their liberty, but they regarded war as an unmitigated evil. Their heroes were lawgivers and prophets, not men of war. The exception was King David, but he was not allowed to build the temple, being a man of blood. And his son Solomon, who symbolized the ideal king, the Messiah, had a name which means peace and reigned in Jerusalem, which means city of peace. It was a shocking thing, therefore, that the Romans glorified war. There was no reason for the Jews to think that the Romans were bringing them the benefits of civilization for which they ought to be grateful. And so far as the Romans were the bearers of Hellenistic civilization, the Jews had already had experience of this since the time of Alexander the Great 300 years before. And the Jews had assimilated as much of Hellenistic culture as they wanted. Insofar as the Romans were political organizers able to impose a system of law and order, the Jews had no need of this either. They had a long tradition of self-government. They had been civilized when the Romans were still a band of outlaws. They had their own time-honored institutions and their own code of law, which in humanity and true civilization was superior to that of Rome. Roman culture was disfigured by degrading slavery, infanticide, human sacrifice, judicial torture, cruelty to animals, features which had been banished from Jewish culture. The book is linked in the video description. The author is Chaim Maccabee. He lived 1924 to 2004. Those historians, therefore, have complained that the Jews were awkwardly restless under Roman rule and ought to have settled down like other nations to enjoy the Pax Romana, a wide of the mark. It's not gratitude for the Pax Romana which made the other nations settle down under Roman rule. 
was fear of Roman might and even more important, worship of Roman success. The Jews were not success worshippers and valued their own culture too highly to wish to see it enslaved. Moreover, it is important to realize that in the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire was only just emerging from its freebooting stage. Though Augustus had begun to make the first movements toward the establishment of respectability, many more years were to pass before the concept of trusteeship became of practical importance. Augustus Octavian himself, after his victory over Antony and Cleopatra, had carried off the entire contents of the Egyptian royal treasury. In successive conquests, vast hordes of treasure in the form of gold, silver, jewels, and works of art were looted by the Romans from Greece, Pontus, Syria, and Egypt. Later, under the Flavian and Antonine emperors, when the available accumulations of treasure had all been transferred to Rome, the Roman Empire became a single administrative unit and a feeling of responsibility developed. But in the time of Jesus, the Romans were still hungrily exploiting their military success. It should be emphasized, too, that the richest parts of the Roman Empire were in the east, where lay the greatest accumulations of wealth. To the Romans of this time, the East was the El Dorado in which fortunes could be made if only one was resolute and ruthless enough. We should think of the Romans of this time not in the image of Marcus Aurelius, but in the image of the Spanish conquistadors who looted South America. Even if one abandons the idea of the superiority of Roman culture, it could be argued that the Jews were unrealistic to dream of freeing themselves from the all-powerful Roman war machine. There is much more reason in this charge. Palestine was a small land and the Jews a comparatively weak people. How could they possibly hope to resist the most formidable professional army the world had yet seen, hardened by a continuous tradition of battle for the past 400 years? Moreover, Palestine, though in itself not a rich land, was strategically important to the Romans since it was a corridor leading to the rich corn land of Egypt, the granary of Rome. It is important that Palestine should not fall into the hands of Rome's chief enemies in the east, the Parthians, who did in fact occupy Palestine for a brief 40 years before the birth of Jesus, who often threatened to occupy it again. Yet, despite all this, the Jews continued to hope that they could expel the Romans and resume their existence as an independent kingdom. Why did the Jews alone, of all the nations conquered by Rome, develop a resistance which continued to struggle for political independence for about 200 years? Why did the Jews hurl themselves against Rome in two bloody wars marked by extraordinary successes as well as by tragic defeat? This phenomenon, dismissed by historians as ingratitude for the benefit of Roman civilization or as mere restlessness or turbulence, had never had the attention it deserves. Chapter 5, Religion and Revolt, The Pharisees The motive force behind the Jewish resistance was the Jewish religion. This is a difficult point for the modern reader to grasp because we are not used to thinking of religion as a political activist revolutionary force. Also, the picture of Jewish religion given in the New Testament is that of a rigid establishment clinging to the status quo allied to the Romans in opposing any innovation. There is no indication in the New Testament of any conflict between Jewish religion and Roman power. In fact, the whole issue of Roman power is played down to such an extent that there is hardly a hint of any opposition to Rome. The aim of the Gospels is to present the revolutionary issue of the day as between Jesus and the Jewish establishment. The fact that there was a Roman establishment against which revolutionary forces existed is veiled so that the establishment against which Jesus rebelled can be represented as entirely Jewish. There was one small religious party, the Sadducees, who were collaborationists, supported the status quo, and accepted official posts under the Romans and their hangers-on, the Herodians. The Sadducees were the party of the wealthier landowners and priestly families. And let's say good morning to Babs. What's going on, man? I can't hear you. There. I can't hear you. Whoa, whoa, Mr. Ford, okay. how are you? Good. So you wanted to talk about Henry V. Oh, yeah. Uh, theater Thursday. Uh, not The theater is usually like cinema, like theater. So, yeah, I mean, I saw, I mean, I've seen two 
And there was another play I think I might have talked a little bit about, which is uh, the Yiddish King Lear, the Jewish King Lear, um, which I saw a recreation of recently. But yeah, uh, there's a, so I saw a performance of Henry V, um, an abridged performance of Henry V at, uh, I think it's, what is it called? Like the American Actors Theater or something like that. It's next to, it's, it's sort of nestled right next to a, like a court building and a kind of a police-ish area around, I think, 54th Street. And um, j sort of just below, just below the 59th Street corner of the park, just a few blocks south of there. So anyway, um, oh, my thoughts on the performance. Wait, hold on. I still have the playbill. Give me a sec. Okay. So I'll read a little more while Babs gets his book. One. Okay. The high priest himself was a Sadducee. It is one of the most important points to grasp in New Testament studies that the high priest was appointed by the Romans. As a member of a quizzling minority group, he was regarded with contempt by the great mass of the nation. Religious authority lay not with the priests, but with an entirely different body of people called the rabbis, who were the leaders of the Pharisees. Thus, the picture given in the Gospels of a Jewish religious establishment, which supported the status quo, is true insofar as it relates to the Sadducees, who were an establishment only in the sense that they were established by the Romans. This guy's a good writer. As far as the mass of the Jewish people were concerned, the true establishment was the dispossessed party of the Pharisees, who held no positions of political power and whose leaders neither sought nor received recognition from the Romans. There were two great wars waged by the Jews against the Romans, quite apart from the many minor revolts and insurrections. Jewish War of 66 to year 70 of the Common Era and the Bar Kokhba Revolt of 132 to 135. First of these is sometimes called the Zealot War, as it stemmed from the activity of the Zealot Party founded by Judas of Galilee during Jesus' lifetime. Okay, back to you, Babs. All right, not to change the topic too much, but yeah, uh, the production I saw, it was, um, let's see, uh, uh, Actors' Equity, uh, Directors Guild of America. Oh, wait, hold on. What's the name of the? Where can I find the front? Oh, here. Henry V, directed by uh, Mary Lou Rosato. It was the American Theater of Actors. Runs from February twenty first to twenty fourth. So I think that's done. But yeah, it's an off Broadway production. And uh, let's see. Um, I guess uh, I. One of the problems that I find with Americans doing Shakespeare is that they're trying to act. They're trying to, like, you know, oh, I'm going to talk like a Shakespearean. And they put, you know, so much emphasis on, on weight, so much emphasis on and weight on so many, so much stuff that doesn't need to be. I mean, I know that, of course, they understand the text because any actor who's doing like an older piece, you know, something like, like say, uh, whether it's a Shakespearean piece or, or any, any other type of piece that's, uh, that's you know got some some terminology that might be slightly difficult to understand. I mean, the Shakespeare Shakespeare really isn't that difficult to understand. But for people like for just in case anyone might struggle with like a phrase here or, or a like concept or reference that might be kind of obscure, there are you know you're supposed to familiarize yourself with things. And I feel like you know even though the actors who I saw tonight probably did do that, or sorry, not who I saw tonight, so who I saw a few nights ago probably did do that. Uh, I just felt like. They were just, uh, especially a lot of the male actors, they were a bit um, kind of loud and shouty and uh, just kind of, they were trying to act. They were trying to sort of act and present, like sh like do this Shakespeare thing and whatnot. And I feel like it could almost have done a bit less there. Fight choreography, absolutely amazing. Fight choreography was really spot on. I thought the costuming was, it was a little unique. It was a little, uh, you know, it's kind of doing the modern, the semi-modern twist type thing, but I actually think they did it fairly well. Uh, I think the king, the actor who played the king, uh, who is it? Uh, as well as um, as well as the actor playing Pistol, and um, you know there were there were a few there were a few yeah a few people who I thought were pretty good yeah I thought also the I mean the um, the main character Henry himself was quite good, and I don't know I, th I fairly good production uh, yeah, it's not going to be I don't think this is going to be playing again but yeah just wanted to go over uh, Henry V. Uh, in New York City, actor with the actors, um, the Actors Theater or something like that by Mary Lou Rosato. <laughs> so, uh, what do you think about this book I'm reading aloud? Uh, Revolution in Judea, Jesus and the Jewish Resistance. 
I find, I find it quite interesting. I mean, I'm more interested in the Jewish resistance than I am in Jesus. I mean, uh, the Obviously, Jesus is yeah. basically, yeah, Jesus is basically just kind of like a side note to me in terms of in terms of at least historical players at this point in time. Like Jesus is a much larger and more and more culturally important player long after you know, in outside of Christian, the sort of or outside of you know extra Jewish affairs, you know, after the fact. So it's like. I'm re I'm really interested in what you're reading, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess um, I've heard different interpretations. Have you ever read Zealot by Reza Aslan? I actually read that with my mother when it came out like four years ago or something, five years ago no, or something I, like that. I yeah. despise Reza Aslan. So. No, I yeah, he, I mean, he, he's an easily detestable fellow, and I even <laughs> kind of got that vibe from him at the time. But uh, yeah, I, I made my way through the book, and I found it quite interesting. And um, yeah, so it's always interesting to see these different sort of interpretations of uh, Jesus' situ uh, situation at this point in time. Yeah, I was trying to to think aloud, like how would I describe my approach? Like how how would I describe my approach when I discuss topics in which I have no particular expertise? Like I don't know Greek, I I barely know Aramaic, and just you know very shallow knowledge of, of Hebrew. I'm I'm not a New Testament scholar, and so I'm often on this stream talking about topics in which I have no expertise. So. I, I use the Warren Buffett rule. Uh, Warren Buffett, when he thinks about a stock and it makes his back ache, he sells the stock. And so when I'm thinking about difficult issues that are probably beyond my, or are definitely beyond my level of expertise, I look for explanations that don't make my back ache, that uh, just make common sense to me that seem clear and, and reasonable. And that's what I'm getting in this Haya Maccabee book. So when I encounter explanations that uh, make my back ache, then <laughs> I, I don't tend to adopt those explanations. I'm, I'm looking for something that uh, makes sense to me if it's clear and uh, if, it, if it seems, seems clear and uh, compelling to me then I'll go, okay, this, this seems clear and compelling to me. And then if it seems uh, convoluted and unrealistic, such as the, generally the depictions of the Gospels don't seem uh, true to life uh, from what I know of Jewish life and what I know of Jewish history and uh, what I know about Roman power in Palestine at the time, uh, then I, I say, okay, these, these don't ring true to me. But I wish there was a philosophical name for this, but I just call it uh, my my Warren Buffett approach. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a sensible way to go about things. And honestly, I'm I've just been really enjoying hearing you read this and just thinking about it off the cuff. Uh, this is a really this is this is quite interesting. This is quite interesting. Just this whole period, I would be interested in reading more about the uh, the historical zealots and the historical zealot movement because I haven't read much on them outside of a few uh, outside of a few essays and you know books that focus more on let's say either the life of Jesus in the case of something like zealot or just on the overall time period and didn't have really have a particular focus. But yeah, they're they're of particular interest to me amongst the different groups. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, the the division? I guess the, the 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 varying the varying divisions amongst Jewish society at the time. Uh, I, there are some people who even say uh, I, I've heard some Jews who have kind of like a more mystical take on things sometimes, but some or, yeah, or I, even. I'm not I'm not mystical, but uh, his, sometimes his they're, they're all re they're all represented today. You know, the four strands of back then are still sort of spiritually and ideologically represented in currents today. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, to me, a strong argument is that there's only one form of Jewish organization present in the first century that is empirically replicated today, and that is the Pharisees. All Jews today who have you know any form of uh, uh, participation in organized Jewish life, with the exception of the tiny, tiny number of Karaites, which is probably fewer than 2,000 in the world. But aside from that, all Jews today are descendants of the Pharisees. Like Pharisaic Judaism is the only form of Judaism that uh, perpetuated itself. So that to me is a fairly strong argument to me that it was the dominant and the important strand of Judaism in the first century. I know. 
people like to talk about, oh, there are all these diverse Judaisms in the first centuries, but only Pharisaic Judaism continued. It just rolled into uh, rabbinic Judaism. And that's, that's the only form of Jewish organization that uh, persisted. Yeah, 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 indeed. And I would say, I mean, probably contrary to what you and most quote Orthodox Jews think, I would say that, you know, the transition from the Pharisee Judaism to the rabbinic Judaism, I mean, this current effectively is why so much of modern Orthodox Judaism is basically the way it is. It was, it was a, you know, branching off a birth from the fair, from the sort of, yeah, Pharisaic, uh, th because at least during this period and sort of during this period and immediately prior to it, the Phar Pharisees have basically sort of crystallized their control over the, uh, the, um, kind of uh, broad um, Jewish theological discourse. Yeah, so they either crystallized their control or they embodied what was the dominant strand. So uh, I guess, I mean, you could take either perspective, right? That the, the Pharisees took control or the Pharisees, who were, who were really simple people in, in the sense that the Pharisees were water carriers and uh, people who chopped wood and people who made shoes. I mean, they were not the priests in the, the great flashy uh, vestments uh, performing spectacular uh, rituals in the temple. The Pharisees were just ordinary workers who taught the Torah. And so one could take the perspective that their fanatical, uh, pedantic, uh, particularistic approach uh, seized control, or you could take the perspective that they embodied uh, the the uh, collective will of the, the Jewish people and they offered the only path forward because effectively all the other approaches died out soon after the first century. Yeah, yeah, could be could be either way, could be either way. I think that uh, I think they're probably a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I know that they they're. I mean, the, even the idea of a quote Pharisee movement. I know that this was this was something that emerged, like the idea of these separate these separate things splitting into movements, just like the idea of cons conservative and reform and whatnot today. If I'm not mistaken, like they, like even these things sort of kind of evolved out at one point or another. But yeah, yeah, perhaps. I mean, I think that uh, I know that uh, Josephus writes about this and Josephus's Antiquities. But um, what is it? Um, I don't think he lists exact numbers or dem or demographic count of like which group is represented, you know, to which degree. I mean, things like that, data like that would be nice, but uh, yeah, census. Now you you were at a comedy yeah. show. What what kind of comedy show were you at? Uh, urban, I would say. Uh, I was I was amused from time to time, but really the jokes all just keep boiling back to the same thing again and again and again, don't they? And isn't this just a great? example of uh, the uh, the vacuum within the soul of the average New Yorker you know being put on being put on parade it's a, it's a circus of uh, of hollowness and uh, uh, would you agree with me that uh, only Orthodox Judaism in in has shown that it can perpetuate Jewish identity. I mean, I do believe there will be non-Orthodox forms of Judaism in 200 years, so they're not going to completely go away. But uh, if you want to, if you're concerned about Jewish identity, you know, passing on through the generations, just like uh, with Pharisaism in the first century, really only Orthodox Judaism apparently empirically provides a path forward for Jewish continuity. Okay, well, in the context of, specifically in the context of the modern West, but in general, if you're comparing, quote, Orthodox Judaism with uh, Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism, I would absolutely agree with you. However, I would also like to point out that there was no conception of, you know, these people are the Orthodox people, here are the Hasidim, you know, here, here are the, the Haredim, you know, that, and like cons these concentric circles of piety versus assimilation that uh, th these different groupings that Ashkenazi Jews were all about. I mean, with broadly from what from what I know and from what I've heard from, you know, people I know and family accounts, as well as uh, just general research that I've done is, is it, it, there wasn't really until recently conceptions of, you know, the, the 
you know, here, here is like, here are the Haradim, here are the Hasidim, you know, here's this, this sect and that sect. I mean, there were like, like sects and stuff in the sense that there were like clans, like tribes, like families, like last names, basically. But those weren't, you know, religious delineations. And there weren't like, and, and there, you know, everyone, everyone, you know, even the quote unquote secular Jews, like they weren't secular Jews. They were just like bad Jews. Like they were just non-practicing Jews and they would have respect and reverence for you know rabbis pretty much just as just as everyone else and uh, uh, respect and reverence for you know custom and tradition and and whatnot and, and it's it's in interesting the way these things play out because even the secular Jews I mean there was no loss of identity here because you would have you know rel like quote unquote secular or Jews or like bad Jews basically Jews who didn't really care too much about Judaism per se like for instance my family was able to you know for I think as far as I know, like I think in some instances, like four generations dating back being functionally secular, like very, very chill and laid back in the whole religious element. But, you know, I think in this might have to do with context because they were Jews living in Arab Iraq or Mandate Mesopotamia or whatever it was called back then. They were, there was an extra element of division. There was something keeping them from assimilating to that society. And also the relationship between Jews and Arabs, you know, that, that very, um, a tumultuous kind of rocky uh like cousin relationship which is which is really uh you know it would be uh, for a jew to uh, to especially in the context of like like iraq or something of like those for a jew to you know mix or intermarry or assimilate with arabs is just is would, would have just been unthinkable so there was effectively this kind of uh implicit identity kept without any need for i guess an an orthodox movement and this is uh i'm not sure i mean i think i think that I don't know what the history is of like Sephardic Jews, Jews in North Africa, but I know about like most Mizrahi Jews, d they were able to perpetuate their identity because I think also with Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews, there's more of an infusion of, to be a Jew, you know, we know, I think we generally know what being a Jew is. Like to be a Jew is to be a Jew. To be a Jew is to be part of like, you know, this tribe, this sort of ethnic unit, you know, it's to come from the Levant and it's also, you know, to, to pay tribute and practice the the heritage of you know Judaism it's to, it's both to come from Judea and it's also to you know to pay tri pay tribute to all the different uh, traditions and rituals of our ancestors to pay you know to pay reverence to the rabbis to like donate to your local synagogue to do uh, to do charity and, um, uh, and other sort of things like that you know some people you know they'll do a few prayers every day some people they'll do one prayer every day some they'll have very varying levels of ritual in their life but uh, it's it's Judaism persisted without having these these strict delineations there. So maybe there is something to be learned from that. But I think a lot of that, like I said earlier, may simply be context dependent. So I'm now, really not sure. Do you know how to smoke a cigar? Uh, yeah, generally, I think you would snip the end off. So you'd snip this end off and then you'd light the end that you snip off. Uh, I believe you inhale from the end that you snipped. So oh, be, so you, you can't inhale that. from a solid end. Oh, okay. So you'd snip that and then you'd light that and then you don't inhale, right? Yeah. I mean, there, there's like the cigar has a head to it, basically. The head is what you snip off like a circumcision. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, so basically you would, you would, um, you see that there's already a part that's kind of ready for smoking. Okay. Okay. And, and uh, what, what are the pleasures? Do you have a cigar cigars? cutter? Uh, no, I'm never going to smoke this, but I'm just curious for, I'm just curious. What are the pleasures of cigars, Babs? Uh, they kind of give you an, uh, they give you a little uh, sort of a, kind of a nice herbally tobacco-y. It kind of has a nice, a nice quality to it. And it gives you a nice tingle and a buzz. You don't want to inhale it like, like a cigarette you don't want to uh you know or, or like like a hookah or an argila or something like that no you you just want to let it linger a little bit or, you know touch your gums and you and the tongue and maybe even a little bit a little bit around your mouth but uh don't inhale it and, uh, very decadent uh, so heavy what about uh, dipping it in alkaline water first does that do anything to it i don't know i've never tried it <laughs> <laughs> so have you tried any of my supplements you ever, you know you tried some alkaline water baths 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been trying alkaline water electrolytes. When are you going to come out with your own special chain of it like Alex Jones? You need your supplement shop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you notice any effect from alkaline water? Yeah. <laughs> Do you notice any effect? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. Alkaline water, electrolytes. Yeah. I mean, all all waters that are infused with things, things like that. You know, they generally make you feel better, and sometimes they even, you know, you'll feel your digestive tract feeling nicer. Some say so, that gut health is key, it, it, the most important thing in when it comes to mental health. Would you agree? Uh, <laughs> I think I triggered Luke. You ran off when I mentioned maybe. gut health. That's why I use immune tree colostrum. <laughs> it's certified six hours colostrum supplement. Immune and, tree colostrum uh, sounds yeah, nice. It's um, you got to take this on an empty stomach. Oh, man, I need my other glasses. Man, but uh, preserving, practicing preventative health gives us peace of mind. And uh, colostrum, uh, it uh, it gives you gut health apparently. So uh, just take a capsule on an empty stomach. Take three capsules daily on an empty stomach. I only take one. I find that uh, one is quite sufficient. It's really all I'm brave enough to take. Uh, given the effect of just one of these babies, I don't think I really want to take it to the next level and take three. But have you tried colostrum, Babs? Uh, no, I've never tried colostrum. Interesting sounding name. It certainly conjures up an image in mind. Not certainly. Yeah, it, it really cleanses. Body. Really cleanses the colon. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Let's talk. Um, I, you were going to say something earlier uh, on the topic that I just brought up. Um, I'm not sure what it was. I was talking about. Uh, I don't remember. Okay, uh, I'll uh, I'll read a little bit from the book and maybe I'll oh cigars back, yeah that, no that's what it was cigars yeah someone in the chat saying inhale and hold like I would I would generally caution against inhaling and holding a cigar okay. smoke I would I would just say uh, you know let it sort of linger in your mouth that's all now I think uh, colostrum is from breast milk and it's really good for the colon everything from breasts is awesome and colostrum is awesome. And uh, nothing like the good old biotine dry mouth moisturizing spray too. Mm. Now the uh, the chat says that my cigar looks dry, so I guess I should I should dip it in the old alkaline water. Okay, let me read more from this book, and we'll discuss. The Zealots were Pharisees. Judas of Galilee himself and his partner Zadok were Pharisee rabbis. The Zealots were the militant activist wing of the Pharisee party, sharing all religious viewpoints with their fellow Pharisees and differing from the majority of the party only on the question of the timing of active resistance against the Romans. The Second Great War, the Bar Kokhba Revolt, was entirely Pharisee in direction and inspiration. Bar Kokhba himself was a Pharisee, and his chief supporter was Rabbi Akiva, the most influential Pharisee rabbi of the time. So from first to last, the resistance against Rome came from the Pharisee party. This statement will come as a surprise to those whose knowledge of the Pharisees depends on New Testament accounts. The Pharisees there are represented as being concerned only to safeguard their own official positions. The idea that such people could take part in subversive activities, that they could risk their lives for freedom, that they could die, as so many of them did, heroically and in agony on the cross, seems quite remote from the New Testament portrayal. And just uh, jump in if you ever want to, uh, Babs. Who were the Pharisees? What were the religious points at issue between them and the Sadducees? Why did the Pharisees adopt an anti-Roman standpoint while well, the Sadducees were collaborators? In the Gospels, the Pharisees are portrayed as allied to the Sadducees and the Herodians in opposing Jesus and in supporting the status quo. That's why the New Testament just does not seem uh, realistic to me. It's, it's obviously a propagandistic work with an anti-Pharisaic agenda. The Pharisees are not exactly shown as collaborators with the Romans, but this is only because the Romans are such shadowy figures in the Gospels. 
though the question whether to resist them or collaborate with them hardly arises. The powers that be are the Jews. Pilate, the Roman, appears only as a background figure on whom the Jews call in their vendetta against Jesus, whom they have to manipulate and mislead in various ways to wreak their vengeance. Fortunately, there exists a wealth of source material from which it is possible to obtain a more truthful picture of the Pharisees. Josephus gives much valuable information about the history and attitude of the Pharisees, and there is also a huge literature written by the Pharisees themselves. I could really do with a colostrum right now. Don't you feel like a colostrum, folks? Mm. Mm. I can feel my bowels opening up. Hopefully you don't mean like there, there are perforations in your stomach lining or something like that when you say that. Good God, your bowel's opening up. <laughs> I mean, what is that? So it's acting like a digestif, I assume. Oh, I mean, I'm just feeling such flow down there right now. <laughs> it's like everything's just like moving on down. It's beautiful, Babs. It's beautiful. Mm. Mm. Ah. And there is right, also a huge literature written by the Pharisees themselves. What did you want to say, Babs? No, 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 nothing. Good. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps the best way to correct the stereotype of the Pharisees as dry as my cigar, dry <laughs> as dust, <laughs> critical legalists, is to read the beautiful liturgy composed by the Pharisees which still forms the main part of the Jewish daily prayer book, the Siddur, in which was the main influence on the formation of the Christian liturgy. The central religious distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was on the question of the oral law. Pharisees held that in regard to the revealed word of God in Scripture, the Old Testament as Christians, they'd have called it, and especially the five books of Moses known as the Torah or teaching, there was an oral tradition consisting of interpretations and enactments supplementing and developing the written law. So before there was the written Torah, it was an oral tradition that was handed down. Then it got written up into the, to the Pentateuch, the, the five books of Moses. But when the five books of Moses were written down, there was an oral tradition that, that was kept up interpreting the written Torah. And this oral, oral Torah tradition. got written down. The problem with oral traditions is if you, you could be like, you know, I come from the, I have safeguarded the true oral tradition and this is how it is. And this is how it's been passed down. And back then you could like, I'm just saying there, there is room for, for a sort of, um, I, I, there was interpretation. Basically the Pharisees, if I'm not mistaken, they claim to have like the, 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 the like, the, the oral Torah. They basically claim to be the or interpreters, interpreters like the modern day interpreters and bearers of the oral Torah during or dur during that period, during uh, during and then yeah. So then you had the the Essenes, Essaim, who are basically yeah, like you were saying, were relied upon the uh, the priestly, the sort of more priestly interpretations, uh, which are were not interpretations, but sort of like priestly decrees and laws, basically. So you had the so you had the the people who the Pharisees basically claimed to be representing the oral Torah for the majority of at least I think their the time their time present there here, and uh, then you had the uh, what's it called? You had sort of the priestly the priestly Essenes who who did who did collaborate who did collaborate, and there are instances of of Pharisee of Pharisee collaboration. Uh, I think sometimes there there were like a few instances or things you can that you can point to where you'd be like, oh, they didn't, you know, they they could have done this, that, and the other, which you know, like Sikari, you know, zealots or something like that would have done or something like that. So to me, I think the Pharisees, you know, they were they're a little a little too moderate for me, and but and also I'm not sure I'm I'm ambiguous. I the most the part that I'm most reluctant about as as sort of a you know a Jew sort of verging verging on Balthasuva. Uh, is the, um, the not just the the manner in which the oral tradition is treated, but the whole yeah the whole oral tradition and the whole and the and the rabbi culture as well as the the legalism you know some of these elements about Judaism kind of make me make me somewhat apprehensive to this day. But yeah, uh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm just finding this very okay. So 
we we live in a protestant country still that's being dominated by by protestantism and protestantism has a unique attitude in all the world's religions it holds in sola scriptura that the bible and the bible only shall be our creed that only the bible contains divine revelation so all other religions have traditions that they uh regard with with great respect and as an integral part of the tradition i mean judaism does not work without an oral tradition interpreting the the written torah so i misspoke are, I, I confused uh, essenes and sadducees i meant i meant to say sadducees, yeah, the, not yeah, essenes. The sadducees did not accept the divine nature of the oral tradition so remember once again before there was anything written down there was an oral tradition finally this oral tradition was uh, written down in the form of the five books of Moses. But at the same time as that was written down, uh, there was an oral tradition interpreting it and applying it to changing circumstances. So one can hold that every word of the, the written Torah is divine, but still you have to apply it to constantly changing circumstances. That's why you need a tradition. Question from the chat, how isn't proselytizing a part of Judaism? How did Judaism ever spread? Well. Proselytizing became a part of Judaism uh, about uh, 2,300 years ago. For a few hundred years, it was a part of Judaism. The book of Matthew says that uh, the Pharisees would cross oceans to make one convert. And there have been historians such as Salo Baran, I think who was at Columbia University, who said 10% of the Roman Empire, uh, basically at the time of Jesus, was, was Jewish. Uh, when Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire, it uh, forbade Jews from proselytizing. And so uh, as a tiny minority in the diaspora for the past 2,000 years, uh, Jews have faced uh, pretty strict uh, restrictions against proselytizing and persecution for proselytizing. So 2,000 years of habit of not proselytizing don't go away overnight. So proselytizing does not... Uh, does not come naturally to Jews. And uh, let's let's go through the chat. Captain Testicles says, Luke reminds me of a character from Curb Your Enthusiasm. So I had a friend who I used to, used to do a show, uh, I had a friend, a rabbi friend, and he was invited on to play a role on Curb Your Enthusiasm, but because it wasn't sneers, so it wasn't modest, he, uh, he turned it down. And Holly says, Sola Scriptura doesn't work when you don't even have the right canon. Well, I don't think Sola Scriptura works in any event because I think Protestants are fooling themselves when they say the Bible and the Bible only will be our creed. For example, the doctrine of the Trinity is not in the Bible, and yet it's an essential part of Protestantism. So there are all sorts of essential parts of Protestantism that are not in the Bible that come from tradition, but uh, Protestants, because of their sola scriptura creed they have to keep ascribing things to the bible that aren't really in there so tradition is essential for uh maintaining and developing a religious community so holly talks about uh, martin luther removing seven books from the bible so he's referring to the septuagint so the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible is different. The Catholic Bible contains the, so the no, the Apocrypha. Oh, I'm, I'm getting my uh, Septuagint is the, uh, the Greek translation of the Bible. I'm getting that wrong. So the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha books, that's what I'm referring to. That's what's contained in uh, the Catholic Bible. So why do some Bibles have a section called the Apocrypha? So during the period between the completion of what Christians call the Old Testament or the Tanakh, Jews, the Hebrew Bible and the first writings included in the New Testament, uh, many essays, psalms and historical accounts circulated through synagogues and early churches. Some of these documents came to be regarded by certain of the believers as divinely inspired and deserving of a place in the canon. And this is called the Apocrypha literature. So it consists of 14 booklets, including first and second Maccabees, uh, first Estrus, and uh, other books of Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Ecclesiasticus, and the Wisdom of Solomon. 
since neither Jesus nor the apostles make any reference to the apocryphal books, uh, Protestants have regarded their authority as secondary to that of the 39 books of the Old Testament. Okay. Oh, wow. Holly says, I don't believe in Sola Scriptura. I'm in the process of converting to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. That is fascinating. From Lutheranism. The Karaites believe that Talmud is just the opinion of men and man's wisdom, but rejected as God-given and divine. But as there are fewer than about 2,000 Karaites in the world, they don't really matter. Just scrolling through the chat. Okay. Let's get back to this uh, Higher Maccabee book. Okay. Central religious distinction between the Pharisees and the Sadducees was on the question of the oral law. The Pharisees held that in addition to the revealed word of God in Scripture, the Old Testament, there was an oral tradition consisting of interpretations and enactments supplementing and developing the written law of the five books of Moses. Sadducees, on the other hand, held that the whole of Judaism lay in the written law in the Bible, which was a closed and final revelation standing in no need of interpretation or development. And yet, the written law still doesn't work to to implement in daily life without an oral tradition. So the Sadducees did have an oral tradition and they did have to interpret the written law. They simply didn't ascribe the, the oral tradition to God. Sadducees wanted to keep Judaism simple. They wanted it to be centered around three great institutions, the, the five books of Moses, the priesthood and the temple. Judaism to them was mainly a matter of fulfilling the cultic requirements of the temple worship as laid down in the priestly code. As for contemporary economics or politics, nothing could be found about them in scripture, and consequently such matters lay outside the sphere of religion could be decided purely on grounds of convenience. Such a doctrine appealed particularly to rich landowners and practical politicians who wanted to avoid interference from religious idealists and reformers. Sadducees would not have denied that scripture contains rules of moral conduct as well, as ritual prescriptions, but they had no desire to adapt the moral rules or complicate them in any way to make them more relevant to the circumstances of their own day. To the Pharisees, however, this policy was in their own graphic phrase to put the Torah into a corner. The Torah was to them a living thing, I guess like the living constitution, which must continually encounter and grapple with new circumstances, thus giving rise to new decisions which became a part of the developing oral law. Sounds a little bit like the common law tradition, right? In the Anglo world. This does not mean the Pharisees regarded the Bible as imperfect. It was the word of God revealed to Moses and the prophets, but new circumstances were continually drawing out of it new depths of meaning as context was inexhaustible. This growing knowledge of the possibilities of the Torah revealed through time in the process of history was the oral law. What became written down in the Mishnah and then commentaries on the Mishnah became the Talmud, which received uh, final form about year 500 of the Common Era. In other words, the place of the Torah was not in heaven, but in the hands of men, and the oral law was thus the working human reality of the divine revelation. Since they could not put the Torah in a corner, the Pharisees could not compartmentalize life or narrow down the scope of religion. To them, there was no such thing as a religious sphere or a neutral sphere to which religion did not apply. The Torah was not limited or circumscribed in its subject matter. It was meant to be applied to the whole of life, and if there was no explicit text which could be shown to be relevant, it was necessary to apply the principles and spirit of Judaism to arrive at a judgment. Pharisees, consequently far from being establishment figures, were usually critical of the establishment. Originally called Hasidim, they fought against the Syrian Greek emperors and their quizzling Jewish high priests. Soon, however, they are at odds with the new Jewish royal dynasty, the Hasmoneans. When this dynasty was supplanted by Herod, the Pharisees were eventually his chief opponents. And when, after Herod's death, the establishment became the Roman occupying force, backed once more by a quizzling high priesthood, it was the Pharisees who were the backbone of the opposition. Let me check the chat.
Yeah, I just want to point out these the the Hasidim here. Although they do inspire the name, this is different from the modern day Hasidic movement, the Hasid the movement of yes. Hasidism, which which rose up years later. It, you know. Yeah. Good point, Babs. Okay, let's keep reading here. Since the Sadducees were the conservatives who opposed innovations and reform, it has been assumed by most writers that they came first. The Pharisees, however, always claimed that the oral law of which they were the supporters and champions went back to the origins of Judaism, that the Sadducees in denying the oral law were heretics who were both attempting to abolish a fundamental religious principle. Both Josephus and Philo attest that the Pharisees were the guardians of very ancient traditions. It is possible that the Sadducees began as a protest movement against the accumulation of extra scriptural traditions and the growth to authority of the scribes or rabbis who are experts on these traditions. Just as the, Pharise just as the Sadducees were the religious party of the rich and powerful, the Pharisees were the religious party of the poor and powerless. And this is a fact that can be ascertained easily enough from Josephus and the Talmud, but which is entirely obscured in the New Testament. Uh, 50 years ago, there was a saying that uh, if a Jew made uh, less than $50,000 a year, he was orthodox. If he made less than $100,000 a year, he was conservative. If he made uh, less than $200,000 a year, he was... Wait... If he made more than 150,000 a year, he was reform. And if he made more than uh, $300,000 a year, he was Baha'i. Josephus' testimony is as follows. The Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers, which are not written in the laws of Moses. And it is for this reason that the Sadducees reject them say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, meaning the five books of Moses, but are not to observe what are derived from the tradition of our forefathers. And concerning these things, it is that great disputes and differences have arisen among them, while the Sadducees are able to persuade none but the rich and have not the popular obsequious to them, but the Pharisees have the multitude on their side. Josephus also says about the Pharisees, these have so great a power over the multitude that when they say anything against the king or against the high priest, they are immediately believed. So the Pharisees were like the, the populist Donald Trump movement and the Sadducees were like the, the globalist oligarchs of the time, making a deal with empire. From the Talmud, we learn that the leading Pharisees such as Hillel, Shammai, Hanina, Ben Dosa and Akiva came from the working class and even at the height of their fame, they worked as woodcutters, shepherds, carpenters, shoemakers, etc. The Pharisees numbered in the time of Jesus about 6,000, according to Josephus, meaning these are the rabbis. Their adherents would number in the hundreds of thousands. These were the members of the body of comrades, the Haverim, as they called themselves. Their leaders were called Hakamim, wise men, and were later given the title of master or rabbi before their names. These leaders were also sometimes known as the scribes after the title of Ezra and his followers in late biblical times. Pharisees, in fact, regarded Ezra as the founder of their movement. They regarded themselves as the heirs of the prophetic tradition. The priests and the rabbis were two distinct groups with quite different functions. The priests, the Kohenim, were a hereditary caste, the descendants of Moses' brother Aaron. Their main function was to perform the service of the temple, assisted by the Levites who performed the temple music, carried the water for the ablutions. A whole priestly tribe of Levi, of which the Kohenim formed one family, was forbidden to own land and lived on voluntary tithes contributed by the devout. When the temple was destroyed, the role of the priests and Levites entered and they ceased to be of importance in Judaism. Though as a memento of their previous role, they were given certain privileges in the service of the synagogue, such as being caught up first to the reading of the Torah and blessing the congregation with the priest's blessing, which has been incorporated into the Christian liturgy. The priests as such had no teaching role and had no power to pronounce on matters of religious doctrine or practice. This was the province of the Hakamim, the wise men or rabbis, who for their part had no role in the service of the temple. To become a priest, one had to be born into the house of Aaron, 
but to become a rabbi, no qualifications of birth were required. The position was open to anyone who had the necessary ability. The rabbi was essentially a lay leader who followed his own trade, but gave his knowledge and advice as a teacher and judge when required. This tradition of unprofessionalism in the rabbinate lingered for a long time. As late as the Middle Ages, great rabbis like Maimonides and Nachmanides refused to accept payment for their services, made their living in some other profession, often as doctors. While there was conflict between Pharisees and Sadducees, there was no antagonism between the rabbis and the priests. The division of function between them was too well understood for that. Priests not only lacked teaching authority, they never even claimed it. Most of the priests were themselves Pharisees or supporters of the Pharisees. It's only the rich high priestly families who were Sadducees. The priests recorded a more lofty status among the Sadducees, but this was more in theory than in practice. As Josephus points out, even the Sadducees followed the rulings of the Pharisees in most cases. The division of function between priest and teacher did not begin with the Pharisees. It was one of the oddest features of Judaism. Moses, the prototype of the teacher, was not a priest. He gave this function to his brother Aaron. The prophets who succeeded Moses were rarely priests, though there was no bar against a priest becoming a prophet like anyone else if he discovered he had the gift. Ezekiel, for example, was a priest. The distinction between priest and teacher enabled the Jews to preserve the heart of Judaism from corruption. This remains true even though there were certain periods when the role of priest and teacher did coalesce. It was very hard for Gentiles such as the Greeks and the Romans to understand the religious official who wore the gorgeous robes and presided at religious ceremonies with pomp and circumstance was ultimately of no religious significance and that the religious authority whom the Jews most revered might be some penurious village shoemaker who was the chief repository of the law. Okay, I'm starting to get tired. I'm going to go back to bed. Any final thoughts, perhaps? Uh, you you were talking about uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb skin in the game a few months ago. I think that the yeah. uh, the tithe system that you mentioned a moment ago is a, is a it's it seems like a quite an intelligent uh, skin in the game system, as well as the balancing of the um, balancing of I guess uh, royalty and aristocracy with uh, you know the the insights of lay people, and then you know add on top of this you know uh, a king or, or monarch or, or aristocracy or or some or, or uh, some sort of political thing like that, and you would have a you know kind of a multifaceted system that would balance itself out quite nicely. And I think, yeah, I think that it's really interesting to hear about this. Very interesting societal models. Maybe some things that modern Jews should reconsider. Great read, Luke. Thanks for letting me join you as usual. Okay, thanks, Babs. Thanks, everyone. Bye, bye.